The film you're about to see has no characters, it has no people. It is a film to describe to you and explain visually the effect of cymatic frequencies on texture, structure, water, oil. If you spare a little of your imagination as you watch this film as it runs, you will see many things that answer many questions. You will see living forms, living amoeba, almost animal-like creatures. You will see continents being formed, the Earth itself coming into existence, explosions, eruptions, atomic explosions and bombs. You can see all this and watch it before your eyes. But any, everything owes its existence solely and completely to sound. Sound is a factor which holds it together. Sound is the basis of form and shape. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. We are told that this is how the world began and how creation took shape. If we put that into the modern idiom and say that into the great voids of space came a sound and matter took shape. Please watch carefully. We can also use different shapes of plate. Here we have a triangular plate with a crystal attached to its underside and produce a sonorous fit. We change to a higher note and see a rather more complicated figure. This more elaborate figure, likewise on a steel plate, is also produced by vibration. The exciting crystal is attached to the upper corner of the plate. We use sand and lycopodium. The lycopodium moves to the center of the fields and takes up circular shapes. The sand forms the lines. Each material has its own special way of behaving. Lycopodium alone, a sonorous figure, transition to a mobile flowing phase, and back again to the figure. The sonorous figures represent stationary waves. But now we can also observe moving waves. Here the sand is flowing in a current. When the wavelengths are short, these currents produce a rotary effect. Areas become defined in which the particles are actually rotating.
Now we produce two notes with frequencies which are so related as to cause a beat. The note seems to throb and, by using the method we have chosen, this phenomenon of beat or interference can be rendered visible. The figure sways to and fro, the figure pulsates. The picture has changed completely. Now we are exciting fluids. Under vibration, a layer of turpentine forms a regular lattice work. Vibrating glycerin, we see continuous waves which form the queerest figures. And yet, the extraordinary things we see here are simply and solely the effect of vibration. Here is a sonorous figure shown in a fluid. There are some wave fields where there was nothing before. Where there was previously sand, now there is nothing to be seen. The dynamic phase has become the static phase. Wave fields which make the vibratory process in the plate indirectly visible. Here again, interference can be demonstrated. All these wave fields pulsate. Interference becomes visible. fluid, colored black, is dripped into a transparent fluid. Vibration now gives rise to curious eddy formations. It is always a pair of eddies that is created. One pair after another is generated so that we finish up with a whole series of such pairs of eddies in a symmetrical arrangement. of these eddies by vibration 
is particularly significant because it is eddies of this kind which are specifically formed in the cochlea of our ears whenever we hear sounds. That is to say, they are not ordinary eddies as defined in rheology, but vibratory eddies, with the members of each pair turning in opposite directions. plastic substance. A plasticizable substance is always shaped into a ball by the wave trains of the vibrating membrane. The masses are jiggled round, but gradually proper spherical shapes are formed, created by nothing more than the vibratory process. The human voice can also be made visible with a simple apparatus. The various vowels show typical characteristics depending on the nature of their sound. We can see the spectrum, as it were, of the sounds. as a sequence of vibratory patterns. We can see a melody. be made visible. The same membrane that emits the music can also make its vibratory processes visible through the medium of a fluid. Here we have the last 89 bars of the first movement of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. We can see Mozart while we hear him.
Mycopodium powder, the spores of the club moss, reveals a number of quite remarkable phenomena when made to vibrate. Circular shapes appear, but these are in a state of continuous upheaval. The particles are pushed outwards from the center and inwards again from the outside. And at the same time, they pulsate. can recognize the various patterns of the vibratory fields. They move to and fro, unite, and separate again according to the vibratory state of the surface formed by the membrane. And we can, as it were, move over a landscape which is in a state of vibration. If we intensify the note, if we produce a crescendo for the ear, the masses are hurled outwards. We see fountains, eruptions, explosions almost. But invariably, the particles return to the center, so that here again, even under these violently dynamic conditions, we find there is circulation. a quick glance at a phenomenon with no vibration. Two liquids which spread by surface tension. No vibration is involved, but this phenomenon also progresses periodically, expressing the ubiquitous law of periodicity. Now we excite the surface on which the liquids are running. An entirely different picture is produced. It is even possible to make out a circular formation. Now there is vibration. But then the vibration slowly ceases and again we see a phenomenon without vibration. The regular pulsation of these spreading masses of fluid.
The behavior of iron filings, when subjected simultaneously to a magnetic field and vision, shows that adhesion to the surface is substantially reduced. The magnetic lines of the force round the poles show up with exceptional clarity. If we cluster the magnetic lines together, we can see the effect on the patterns formed. If we thin out the lines of force, the phenomenon spreads out. Because of the reduced adhesion, the particles of iron have certain degrees of freedom. They can move, fall into line, form figures, and almost dance, but only in obedience to the vibration imposed. Even these serpent-like formations are produced simply and solely by vibration over areas of the vibrating membrane representing movement processes. materials and substances and the various states of aggregation behave in characteristic ways under the effect of vibration, or we can say that their behavior is specific. Here is a pulp. Here again, round shapes are formed and the circulation is set in motion, but in the opposite direction to that observed with lycopodium. There is a definite ripple effect caused by the wave trains in the vibrating membrane, a rich field of effects due to vibration. They join together, separate, and pulsate. If we intensify the vibration, equivalent to a crescendo for the ear, the masses are thrown into ever greater agitation. They are ejected. Spikes are thrust up. There are eruptions. Protuberances appear. And all 
due to the dynamics of vibration. A whole landscape opens before us. The note we hear is strong enough to originate all this turbulence, this impressive display. Here, by way of contrast, is a sonorous figure, a static figure instead of a dynamic one, representing the opposite pole in the vast range of phenomena that make up the world of vibration. dedicated to research and awareness of the use of sound and music for well-being. My guest is Dr. Peter Guy Manners. Peter Guy Manners is a doctor from England. He holds a number of different degrees, including Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Osteopathy, as well as PhDs from both Oxford and Heidelberg University. He has researched and worked with Dr. Hans Jenny of Baal, Switzerland, Professor Gaveau of the Sorbonne in Paris, France, Dr. Brunner of Heidelberg, Germany, and George Delaware at the Delaware Laboratories in Oxford, England. Since 1961, Dr. Manners has been applying his knowledge of the effects of sound for healing into the development of cymatics, which is now internationally known and used in various parts of the globe. His Brett Fortin Hall Clinic in Worcestershire, England, specializes in the use of cymatic therapy, the direct application of sound on the body for healing. Dr. Manners, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Johnson. It's very nice to be back here, too. Well, I wonder if you could tell us what exactly is cymatics? That is, is it a new form of therapy, or is it something that is very ancient, very old? What can you tell us about it? Well, basically, it is not something which is new. Um, it has been researched over a long period of time. Uh, a lot of research has gone into the work, and it has been in use for approximately 20 years in our clinic in Worcestershire. But over and above that, you ask, is it very old? Yes, mm. it is very old. Uh, the concept of sound or music or any of these type of things is as old practically as man himself. But in cymatic therapy, we have adapted it into the modern idiom, and, and now it is used in a technological way, which is scientifically approved, um, medically acceptable, and is in use in many clinics throughout the world. Is there some sort of history of the use of sound or music being used in ancient civilizations? I've heard that uh, stories of this type of... Oh, yes, areas. many of them. Um, we have worked... Uh, in the research field, and in order to work in the research field, you have to go backwards as well as forward. Mm -hmm. And we have traveled into many countries uh, examining the techniques anywhere where there's been any suggestion that uh, sound of any type was used. Uh, we found great evidence of that amongst the American Indians, uh, where they used sound and vibration to heal the sick. Uh, in Greece, in Egypt, in China, 
in Mexico, in Brazil, in practically all the countries uh, it has been used. Also in biblical times, of course, um, music and the formation of sound into a music form uh, was used with very great success, and you'll find great evidence of this in your Bible. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, how so? There are many references to uh, calming the savage beast with music, and also we all remember the story of uh, uh, King Saul and the harpist that he always had to relieve his tension, his stress, and his strain. Uh, young David, I believe it was. Precisely. Yes, yes indeed. The Pythagoras, who we know as the uh, father of geometry, was also involved in this uh, work. Is that true? Or, um? Yes, that's perfectly true. Um, but also the, the temples of Delphi, um, in, we have discovered uh, comparatively recently that music and sound was one of the concepts of their healing technique. Um, a lot of the stories which have been written concerning the temples of, of uh, uh, Delphi are not wholly correct. And uh, we found that uh, the pulsation of beating notes and music was one of the therapies which they used. Mm, fascinating, fascinating. Now, is cymatic therapy, what is it though? Is it, is it sound, is it music, is it, um, is it something you play from a tape recorder, is it? Um... Well, of course, when you refer to sound, everyone sort of associates it with something that you listen to. Uh, with cymatics, this is not precisely so. It is literally the transplanting or the transmutation of accepted frequencies of sound into the tissue and structure of the human being. All the all, uh, uh, areas of the body, all the organs of the body, uh, produce a harmonic, a sound. Uh, this sound is very small and very minute. Um, th this again is not a new concept, not a new theory, uh, but it is only in comparatively uh, recent years uh, that technology has caught up with the concepts and the ideas of this, and we've been able to reproduce these frequencies and sounds and now we can reproduce them, create them artificially, and transmit, transfer them back into the tissue and the structure. A lot of our doctors are referring it to transplant because technically I suppose this is what we are doing. We are transplanting the corrected frequencies back into the structure to replace any abnormalities that exist there. Mm. Also, of course, one of the strongest points which we advocate is that we can use this in place of drugs and medicine. And uh, if we can replace medicine with treatment, we find this is much better. It takes a little more time, and you have to have a little more attention from your individual practitioner or your doctor. But then that is one of the things which we are trying to push forward at the present moment, that um, the medical profession treats every individual as a holistic being rather than a condition. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying that there are different frequencies for different parts of the body and that with cymatic therapy you would somehow inject or put in the uh, correct frequency that is needed for for that part of the body is that correct um, that's correct and um, you see every part of the body possesses a harmonic whether it's a harmonic of the heart the lungs the liver the kidney muscles bones nerves whatever it is it produces a harmonic this harmonic is now tabulated, we know what they are, and we can uh, reform these artificially on a computer. Mm -hmm. Then it can be played back into the structure and the system. It is pleasant, it is easy, uh, it is comfortable, there's no side effects. Uh, there are no, literally no conditions where it cannot be used, except if the patient is has a heart pacer, but then that applies to all techniques of treatment if the patient has a heart uh, um, meat, uh, problem there. But other than that, there are no conditions that can't be treated. Even in pregnancy cases, we've treated them right up to the time of delivery. Mm-hmm. Now, cymatics, what does the word mean? Well, in its early stages, which was now over 20 years ago, it was called sonic medicine or sonic therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the general public got this uh, confused with ultrasonics, which is quite understandable. 
Uh, so therefore we change the name to cymatics. Cymatics is a Greek word meaning pressure or waves. While we are using pressure waves mm -hmm. combined with the sound so it's perfectly technically correct. Also it pays tribute to uh, one of the uh, doctors whose groundwork formulated this concept and this therapy, and this was Dr. Hans Jenny of Baal in Switzerland, and he called his form of research cymatic, cymatic research. He did invaluable work, but what we have done is to bring the research of various physicists and doctors and scientists together, uh, the list that you've already quoted, uh, bring those together, and out of that we have evolved uh, a technique of treatment which is now internationally known and is used right throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jenny's work has been published in a couple of books. Um, That's correct. There are two books which are beautifully illustrated and shows the formation of shapes and forms that can be uh, created by various frequencies of sound. Um, he lectured very, very little. He uh, objected to standing on a platform and lecturing, um, but he did make records of all his work. Uh, he made film of it. He took photographs of it. The books were illustrated from it. And just before he died, he passed all his research over to us uh, so that we could amalgamate it and fit it with other concepts of therapy. There's one doctor which we have left out in your list, and um, he was very, very important, and that's Dr. Harold Saxon Burr. Uh, without uh, the concepts that he formulated, uh, we shouldn't be in the position we are today. It's only thanks to these people who have laid the foundations on which we can construct this therapy that we owe so very much to. Dr. Saxon Burr was associated with Yale University? He was at Yale University, And yes. his main um, work involved? His main work was uh, being able to discover that you can measure the frequencies of radiation outside of the body. When he first postulated this theory, I mean, it was um, mistrusted. I mean, uh, at that day and time, I mean, very little was known about it and uh, no one quite went along with what he was saying. Uh, but uh, fortunately, before he left this planet, uh, he was able to come back to Yale University, and I think the expression is his picture was turned away from facing the wall, <laughs> and there's now a picture on the wall again. Because he was a very famous and a very talented man, and the work that he did was absolutely invaluable in the fields of research. And we find that now we're moving more and more into this field of research, that more and more of the uh, technical truths which he uh, wrote up and experimented with are uh, of invaluable use to us. Mm. What are your basic principles of using sound or cymatic therapy as a uh, healing tool? In the first and early days of this, we kept it locked into the use of muscular diseases, bone diseases, joint deformities, rheumatism, arthritis, fibrositis. Now we kept it into these various um, diseases uh, for several purposes. The main one was to accumulate as much information and knowledge and case histories as we possibly could to validate our concept and our theory. Um, but also there was other things coming to uh, um, the concept and that was it was very easy to treat because you treated the surface of the body. Um, but as it has gone along over the past 20 years, we have found now that we can treat all parts of the body and including the internal organs. And year by year, we are for having reports fed back to us from various doctors and clinics that are using the instrumentation that are feeding back new results and new points are coming to light. Perhaps you could enlighten us a bit more about how exactly you could use a sound or a tone to counteract a disease or something that is not balanced properly in the body. Well, if every organ and every part of the human anatomy gives off a signal, providing all those signals are in line with the general harmonic of the whole body, then you are in good health. But if for any reason, irrespective of what it is, if for any reason any of those frequencies fall out of alignment, 
then you are dis-ease or out of harmony, disharmonic. Um, also, another thing which is uh, very important is that this simplifies to a large extent uh, the method of administering treatment or administering uh, medicine. You see, a lot of these instruments are now being developed for third world countries. Now, we can't hope to train uh, third world people directly into medicine over a short space of time. And if we don't do something quickly, I mean, many people are going to be in dire pain and straits uh, of which no help is done because, I mean, there are far too few medical practitioners to be able to deal with the amount of people that need help and treatment. Therefore, the effect of diagnosing a condition is not so vitally important. If you're dealing with it medically, a diagnosis is vitally important because otherwise you would administer the wrong medication. But if you're dealing with some internal organ that is out of alignment and you're assessing it by its vibrational force field, then providing you can correct, or there's some method or some technique that can correct this vibrationary force field, irrespective of the condition which is causing it, you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. So therefore, many people can be helped merely by injecting the frequency back into the structure. And what also you've got to remember is that the frequency you're in injecting is the natural frequency. You're working hand in hand with nature. You're not doing anything contra to nature because the adverse condition is contra to nature. So therefore, if you're putting in the corrected frequency and signal, the human uh, structure is very keen to get back into mm. alignment. Mm. This is one of the uh, principal problems that have been in the organ transplant in surgery. It is the harmonic concept. Everything is taken into consideration when a transplant is done, whether it's by kidney transplant or heart transplant. Everything is taken into consideration. But up until a short while ago, we gave no consideration to the harmonic. And therefore, if the harmonic of that uh, transplanted heart is not in line with the harmonics of the rest of that system, we use the term, the body rejects the uh, transplant. This is merely what it means. Mm -hmm. It rejects it because the harmonic uh, evaluation of that heart will not fit in with the rest of the harmonics of the system in the body. Hmm. So in other words, um, in order to utilize a sound or a series of harmonics as a healing tool, what you would do is you would inject this into the body and that which was diseased or vibrating out of harmony or ease with the rest of the body would somehow resonate back to its proper frequency. Back to its is proper that, frequency. Right? But one thing we've got to be careful in this, uh, you use the word inject. Now, if we use the word inject, a lot of people think we're going to stick a needle into ah, them and inject something. We transmit it into the system. So the system is easy. There is no breaking of skin or surface. No needles are used. It is an application which is applied to the surface of the body. And if you apply sound in the audible range to the surface of the body, it will transmit itself right straight through the body and out the other side. Now, if there's nothing um, organically incorrect in the area through which that travels, it will travel straight through and be rejected on the far side. No harm will be done, no damage will be done. Mm -hmm. But if there's any abnormality in the frequency of the area that you're projecting the frequency field to, then it will rectify that as it passes through. And merely by simply placing the hand on the far side to which the applicator is applied, you can tell whether the condition is um, advanced or whether it's very bad or whether it's very slight. Mm -hmm. Because if the frequency signal travels through very qu quickly, there is very little wrong in that area. Mm -hmm. But if it takes some seconds or a minute before it travels through, then you know it's meeting obstacles on its passage through the structure. Mm -hmm. What sort of cases have you worked with? Well, we've dealt actually, well, I mean, over that period of time with many thousands of cases. Uh, the early work in the early days was muscular uh, rheumatism, arthritis, uh, fibrositis, and the point was to treat these people 
Now, in advanced cases, we particularly chose advanced cases in some cases uh, to see how long uh, or how much improvement we could get, where medically speaking, we said it was incurable and gone too far. Uh, in some of these cases, uh, the patients had had rheumatic disorders or arthritic disorders for a period of 30 years, mm -hmm. they were elderly people. In many of these cases, we're, we were able to stabilize the condition and prevent further deterioration. But in lots of cases, we got improvement, and if we got cases early enough, then we got a cure. Mm -hmm. uh, but since then, many, many cases have been dealt with which have uh, no sort of relationship to the uh, cases we started off with. I mean, we've treated heart conditions, lung conditions, bronchial conditions, uh, intestinal troubles. Most of these conditions now can all be treated by this technique and hmm. this method. And you um, have some slides that you wanted to show us which may tell us a little bit about the effects of sound on some of the inorganic matter. Well, that is correct, because a lot of these slides are uh, were originally done by Dr. Hans Jenny, showing the effect on substance and liquids and fluids of particular sound frequencies. Now, although they have no medical um, validity at this particular point in time, because we've moved on further to that, they are interesting in as much as you can see the effect. And I think it's always more convincing if you can see rather than just to hear what someone's talking about. So therefore, if you look at the film, uh, the slides, if you look at these slides, you will see how the intricate patterns which we can formulate in substance can be changed merely by altering the frequency fields. Mm -hmm. well, let's uh, take a look at some of these uh, now. We're going to show you now a few slides to give you some idea because I think if you get a visual interpretation of what we have been discussing, you get a better impression of exactly what we're doing, where we can go, what we can create, and what we can form. It is scientifically correct to say that shape and form owe their shape and form solely to sound. And by these slides, we are able to show you how that shape and form can be held and repeated as many times as we wish, merely by the use of sound. Here we show one single drop of water placed on a plate to which the frequency field has been attached. By this means, we've been able to make it visual for you to see the geometric forms that can be formed when the cymatic frequency is filled into the structure. Here we have just one single drop of water vibrating at a low frequency. The low frequency gives the illusion that it is almost solid or semi-solid. It is not, it is just clear tap water and nothing more. Now if we change that frequency, we can change the form and the shape. This is again the same drop of water as in the previous picture, but the frequency field has changed. We have changed it, and so long as that frequency exists, this shape and form will maintain its hold. It will act in this particular way every time this frequency is uh, placed into the plate, which is the dark area around the outside. If we change the frequency back, we can reverse it back to the previous one. But each time we change, so the frequency uh, modulates the single drop of water that's showing on the plate. Here again, we have the same metal plate and the same drop of water. We haven't changed the water in any way, say exactly the same water, but again, we have changed the frequency field. Within this, we are using single frequencies and not the multiple frequencies of the uh, cymatic instrument. But as the frequency goes higher, you will notice that the design within it becomes a little more ethereal. In other words, we are seeing more spaces between. But even so, the spaces are still contained water. Again, same plate, same water. But again, the frequency has changed and we're becoming a little more ethereal again. It's gradually 
tightening up onto these areas and sparsing out in these areas, making the design a little more ethereal, looking less solid, in other words. Now, if the frequency field was changed back, we could recreate any one of these back in line or move them up in line. We can recreate this time and time again and make the same patterns over and over again. Now here we have a complete change, both of the material that we're using and also the frequency field that's being fed in. This was our first realization that we could, apart from making a flat diagrammatic form on the plate, we could evolve it into a three-dimensional figure or form. What we are feeding into here is five frequencies into the plate, which causes this malleable plastic to lift up, to formulate into this form and shape, and fold itself into the center groove along the top. It's in constant movement, but keeping the constant form and shape. This was the first realization that uh, the cymatic concept and the cymatic principle could formulate a design and a pattern which was in similarity aligned to the formation structures within the human body. Now here we have a picture of cellular development showing exactly how the cell structure forms and how this interrelating form folds into this center crevice. It is a moving mass the whole time, moving in constantly, enfolding within itself. Here we have something which is just plastic, it's pliable plastic, but we're feeding a field into it which will create the same movement and basically the same form of the structure as the natural one that preceded it. Here again we have another picture of a cell development dividing into the four uh, concepts and the outer rim around the outside. Again, in a constant state of enfoldment, one side from the outer moving into the inner from all four sides in a constant state. If this was on a moving picture, it would look like a living amoeba pulsing and moving.